Hi, welcome to this uh, video on phylogeny and the evidence for it. So, we'll introduce those terms in a minute, but first of all, I'd like you to think about which of these DNA sequences below do you think are most similar? Uh, don't think about it too hard, just pause the video for about 30 seconds and try and identify which two you think are the most similar. Okay, so I thought about this for a while and I think I've spotted two that are the most similar. First of all, these two, species C and F, well they only differ by um, one base pair and that's this last one right here, uh, the T and the C. But there's another pair of similarities as well, uh, and that's these two, B and E, they also only have a one base pair difference and that's this one, T versus the C here. So. Two pairs are quite similar and others aren't. What does that mean? Well, it means that we could start to draw a relationship between these species. And we call this a phylogenetic tree. Uh, so I had a go at drawing this and this isn't by any means definitive, but I think what we can tell here is that these two pink ones, species F and C, are, are more closely related. And also these two green ones here are more closely related. So we could start to draw a kind of evolutionary tree like this, E and B here, and C and F here, and all the other um, species would be less closely related than those two pairs. So this might be an example of an evolutionary tree. So how, why do we, why do we know this? Why do we know that differences mean that animals are more distantly related? Well, it's all to do with um, DNA mutation. And a point mutation in DNA is when a single base changes, changes letter. Typically this happens during when the DNA is copied, and there's a, there's a relatively fixed rate for this. So here's a little gif of a, a mutation happening. And we know that in mammals, the genome mutation rate is about 2.2 times 10 to the minus 9. So that's only one mutation per, um, hang on a minute. So that's two mutations per billion, uh, per billion base pairs per year. So that's not a lot. Now, it's a little bit higher in um, viruses, specifically RNA viruses. The coronavirus is an RNA virus, so it has a higher rate of mutation. So that's uh, about you know um, one per million base pairs or even one per uh, 10,000 base pairs. So that's a lot, lot higher. So why is this important? Why is um, studying evolutionary relationships important? Well, it comes back to this uh, picture that we looked at a few lessons ago. So this picture I asked you first time round uh, to try and identify which animals you thought more, were more closely related just based on their characteristics. And what I was actually getting you to do was to try and do some sort of artificial classification to, to group organisms based on their observable characteristics. So I was kind of getting you to think, well, which, which of them look more similar? Uh, and I told you actually that this, this kind of led you down the wrong path. Uh, the animals that look quite similar weren't that closely related. So the problem with this artificial classification is that sometimes different animals that aren't related look really similar. Uh, and we call this convergent evolution. And this is when animals that are distantly related kind of evolve um, to fulfill one ecological niche or a similar ecological niche. And they end up with sort of say, the same solutions to that niche. So for example, this echidna and this hedgehog are, are very distantly related. Uh, and there's another third type of animal, which is very similar looking called a tenrec, which is again, quite distantly related. So. It actually turns out that this uh, wolf and this thylacine are separated by about 160 million years of evolution, so they're not closely related at all. The hedgehog and the echidna, it's about 180 million years. This one was quite difficult to figure out actually, so this, this top picture here is supposed to be a great white shark and the bottom uh, was an ichthyosaur, uh, which is an extinct uh, reptile, sort of aquatic reptile species. And it's difficult because, well, the ichthyosaurs died out about 90 million years ago, um, so it's kind of difficult to really say. Um, and sharks, in some form, have been around for, uh, I think, some 200 or so million years, so several, um, several hundred million years. Finally, it's the elephant and this rock hyrax that are the most closely related. They're separated by about 63 million years ago. And that compares um, to about 6 million years for humans to chimpanzees, our closest uh, living sort of ancestor, or clo not ancestor, our closest li living relative species. So that's the problem with artificial classification. So maybe you think, well, I could do better than that. I'm not going to fall for that. 
uh, those easy ones there. I could classify things better if I were just being a bit more considered. Well, have a go. Here are a bunch of cats. Which of these cats do you think are more closely related to uh, each other? How would you group these cats? Are they one group or are they two groups? It's more difficult than it might seem um, initially, and it already seems pretty difficult. The results are actually that um, the ocelot and the marge, so that's these two, ocelot, marge, and the oncilla, are fairly closely related. So up here, ocelot, the marge, and the oncilla. Um, but then this one, the Asian leopard cat, is actually quite distantly related, distantly related. So that's kind of all the way down here. So it's not as easy as it looks. So this leads us onto this new term, which is monophyletic. And that means that all organisms in one group must actually share a common ancestor. So all the organisms, um, let's say, in the group of the sort of ocelot cats, they must share this ancestor. So all these cats here share a common ancestor, the ocelot ancestor, that was around about 2.9 million years ago. And you wouldn't put these animals here in one group with, let's say, um, this jungle cat here without also including all the other ones that are all traced from that common ancestor. So that's what monophyletic means. Uh, a group of organisms should be monophyletic in that they all should share a common ancestor. So, to summarise, artificial classification versus natural classification. So artificial classification is only based on a few observable characteristics. It doesn't reflect uh, the evolutionary relationships between organisms, and it pretty much gives limited information. The kind of upside of it is that it doesn't change over time. It's, it's fixed, uh, or it certainly was when it was used. It's not really used anymore. Whereas natural classification, um, it may change based on new evidence. If we get new DNA evidence, we're, we're uh, going to adapt uh, the way we classify things and maybe reassign them to a different taxon to a different class or family or order etc. So natural classification uses lots of characteristics, some observable externally, some not, and it reflects the evolutionary relationships, thus giving us a lot of information about the organisms. So another word that you need to understand is phylogeny. So phylogeny is the study of the evolutionary relationship between organisms. And it uses mainly DNA and other molecular evidence to try and work this out. So how does it do that? Well, for example, here, this is a graphic uh, showing a comparison of the DNA sequence between gorillas, chimps, bonobos, Denisovans, and then to, to humans. So in this diagram here, the colour going from yellow to red represents the degree of difference uh, in the genetic code along the base pairs. So red being around about 6% difference. Uh, and yellow or you know, very pale yellow uh, being sort of no, dif no notable difference of 0.1% difference. So we can see that we're you know, roughly about 6% different to gorillas. If you kind of average those colors out, I guess we're probably around 3% different to chimpanzees, maybe slightly more, 4% for bonobos perhaps. Um, and these extinct uh, relatives of us, um, quite related to the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, were very similar indeed to us. So we can look at whole genome studies or larger genome studies like that. And we can also look at individual genes. So if you've looked at any of my year 13 videos, you might have seen these two figures. But this figure here shows how one gene, FOXP2, um, has changed through various different primate species. And we actually think that some of these very small changes in FOXP2 gene um, in humans have allowed us to speak um, uh, and have sort of a wide range of different vocal uh, vocalizations to communicate. If you want to have a look at this even more, uh, then I suggest you have a look at this lizard um, kind of video trying to work out the relationships between lizards and I'll post that link in the, in the description below. So what evidence do we use in phylogenetic analysis? Well, uh, when we do phylogenetic analysis, we have to look at conserved genes. So we look at either the DNA sequence or the protein sequence of genes um, that appear in almost all species. So we don't share the same genes with um, a uh, like a fern, like a plant. We don't share the same genes with um, like an alligator, but we do share some genes 
with all species, we do set some few conserved genes, and one of those is called cytochrome C. So cytochrome C is a gene that we have, and pretty much every living thing has it, uh, because it's a protein that's used in respiration. So in humans, this cytochrome C protein is found in the um, mitochondrial electron transport chain, uh, where it basically takes an electron from one place and ferries it to another place, but it's very, very important. If we don't have it, uh, respiration will not proceed. So this protein, cytochrome C, uh, consists of about 104 amino acids. Um, and what we can do is we can compare the human cytochrome C uh, sequence of amino acids and compare the differences between cytochrome C from other species. So we can see that uh, below here, this is a direct comparison. Each of these letters just is, a, is, is referring to a different type of amino acid. So I think G, for example, would be uh, glutamine, possibly. Uh, and between chimps and rhesus monkeys, uh, there's only one difference. And in fact, between chimpanzees and humans, their cytochrome C is exactly the same, completely the same as humans. Whereas uh, if we look at a tuna fish, there's about 21 differences between a human cytochrome C protein and a tuna fish. Therefore, we're more closely related to chimpanzees and less closely related to tuna fish. So here's another uh, diagram sort of showing that. Um, and one thing to note is that if we're just looking at the protein sequence and looking at the amino acids, then there will be some differences that aren't picked up by looking at the protein sequence. And that's because if we look at this region right here, we can sometimes have a change in the DNA code. For example, this base here, G, has changed to A, that doesn't actually change the amino acid code. And that's because this mutation would be called a silent mutation, um, which is because the DNA code is degenerate. That word means that there are multiple um, three-letter codes for each amino acid. Okay, we'll learn more about that in year 13 if you haven't covered it already. So it's actually better, therefore, to look at the DNA sequence analysis. And again, we can either look at the whole genome of an organism, if it's especially if it's a short one, like a viral genome, or we can look at... Uh, genes that many species conserve. Apologies for the typo there. So two of the genes that many species conserve are the 16S ribosomal RNA and also the mitochondrial uh, DNA. So let's first of all look at the 16S ribosomal RNA. Well, here's a diagram of that. Uh, it's a single-stranded uh, ribonucleic acid, and it's coiled up in this kind of quite complicated noodly shape. Um, and you'd find it in the small subunit of the ribosome here. It's actually involved in um, binding, allowing the ribosome to bind to messenger RNA, and it's highly conserved from prokaryotes through to eukaryotes. So bacteria have this sequence, we have the sequence, and it's, it's one of the most highly conserved um, genes in all life forms. This has made it extremely useful for figuring out evolutionary relationships, even between um, early life forms and more complicated multicellular life forms like ourselves. So the other type of um, DNA that we can look at is mitochondrial DNA. So mitochondrial DNA comes from mitochondria. So these are membrane-bound organelles that are found in all eukaryotic cells. And inside the mitochondria, they actually have their own circular genome. Now these mitochondria actually, we think, used to come from bacteria. They're kind of bacteria that have been taken into cells. So they have their own genes and we can read them. Now the interesting thing about mitochondrial DNA is that it's passed only down a maternal line. So that means all the DNA that you have in your mitochondria it was inherited from your mother. So um, this makes it very, very useful for tracking human evolution and migration through time. So this chart shows something called the mitochondrial DNA uh, maternal haplogroup analysis. So that basically shows um, the different types of mitochondrial DNA found in different, different populations around the world. And that's kind of helped us track the movement of people um, from Africa, where all human beings evolved, and how they sort of spread around the world at different times. So the key points about mitochondrial DNA there are that uh, it's only found in eukaryotes, it's inherited maternally, and it's been very useful tracking human evolution and migration. So now we come to a really interesting current application of this um, phylogenetic analysis. There's a lot of information on this uh, chart, and if you've watched the Year 13 video of mine, you may have seen this before. But this shows the phylogenetic relationship between various different coronaviruses. Um, so we're trying to figure out where this coronavirus came from. 
uh, this coronavirus that is now spreading around the human population of the world. And we think that it came from a bat coronavirus, but people have been arguing about this. And the way they've decided is by sequencing the genome of the new human coronavirus and comparing it to coronavirus genomes that are present in the bat population. So we can see the one that is most similar uh, is this bat cov ratg 13 which is sort of in the 95% plus similar region to um, this coronavirus that we uh, are currency, currently um, experiencing at the moment. So you can see there's many, many other different coronaviruses that are present in bats. And this sort of charts the evolution of all, all of those. Here are some viruses that you may also know of. MERS uh, was a coronavirus that caused a, a severe disease outbreak in the Middle East uh, around about 10 years ago. So all of this information, all of this phylogenetic uh, information has gone into building our model of the three domain classification. So the three domain ca classification model uh, is our most up-to-date and comprehensive model for classifying all life forms. And it shows the relationships between all life forms. We've looked at this image before in a, in a previous lesson, uh, and we started the whole sequence by looking at this massive wheel here, which is one of my favorite biological diagrams, because it shows that every single living thing that exists today is related to every single other living thing that exists today, if you go back far enough. This tiny little, uh, central point here represents the evolution of life and what we call the last universal common ancestor from which all life has evolved and every single branch point is a, a point where a population of living things has separated and split we call that speciation uh, and that's happened many 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 thousands of times to produce the diversity of life that we have today all of this um, has been worked out using information uh, from DNA analysis, from also cell membranes, from enzymes, and also and looking at proteins associated with DNA. So well, before we move on to your final questions, I'd just like you to do a quick true or false. Pause the video, read these, and just decide whether you think they're true or false quickly. Okay, what did you think? So taxonomy is a type of phylogeny. That one is false. Phylogeny and taxonomy are different. Remember, taxonomy is the external features and phylogeny is the evolutionary relationships. Number two, phylogeny is concerned with evolutionary relationships over external features. Yes, that's true. Number three, DNA and proteins can be studied to elucidate. That means to work out evolutionary relationships. Yes, they certainly can. Number four, the study of phylogeny has confirmed the conventional five kingdom classification system. That one is false because now we can sort of see that um, the bacterial sort of kingdom and the prokaryotic, uh, the prokaryotic not the bac uh, prokaryotic kingdom, the bacterial kingdom and the pro protoctista uh, is it's a bit more complicated basically. And we can also see that there's the archaea as well as the prokarya or the traditional prokarya that we used to believe in. Uh, and then finally, the chimpanzee, it is more closely related to humans than it is the gorilla. So... Time for some uh, final questions, plenary questions. If you look on page 283 and 285 of your textbooks, uh, you can read over those pages if you'd like again, and I'd like to answer both sets of questions, please. Pause the video, and then you'll come back to the uh, answers on this video in a few minutes, okay? Okay, ready for the answers now, here we go. So uh, if you could check your answers there, green pen your work, and then send me a photo uh, if you're in my class um, of your answers uh, so I can see how you've done um, and then I'll see you next lesson but before you go just going to do a little syllabus check and some of these learning points we've kind of covered in the previous lessons uh, and we sort of just went into more depth today but are you aware now that you sort of understand the evidence that has led for the new classification system the three domains uh, classification system uh, and are you aware how we can use biological molecules such as proteins and DNA and genetic evidence to work out these relationships? And do you also understand the difference between classification and phylogeny? Okay, uh, so that's the end of this video and I'll see you next lesson. Thanks.